How's it going, everybody? So today we're going to be answering questions that came in on the community tab, drinking copious amounts of coffee, and answering your questions. So let's jump into it. All right, first question is from Michael. He says, magical shot. How many shots did you use for the final image and did you use Tony Kuiper's panel? So the image that he's referring to is this one. This is a shot that we actually took on the first morning or the, yeah, I guess it was the first morning of my Oregon Coast workshop. Hands down, some of the best light that I've ever gotten at this particular location. This was a sunrise and sunrises in general are kind of tough on the west coast because a lot of times you know they're very obscured because you're looking west but in this case we're looking south and we got just a beautiful sunrise so this shot is actually a two shot exposure blend one exposed for the sky one exposed for the shadow information in the majority of the shot and it was kind of a tough sit shooting situation because this is pre-dawn so it's quite dark and we were kind of sharing a tripod of one of my participants came down the trail without a tripod so i was letting him use it for the most part so i didn't get a chance to shoot much so i didn't have as much time as i would have liked to get a nice long low iso exposure the shadow information shot is actually shot at iso 400 just because iso 100 was not giving me enough detail in my shadows so i just cranked up my ISO a little bit, did a three second or a 30 second exposure because I didn't have time to do like a two and a half minute exposure at ISO 100. Took the two shots, blended in the sky from the darker frame, added some contrast and noise reduction to that sky, a little, a little bit of oomph, which helped with the saturation, a little dodging and burning, a little bit of Orton effect, bada bing, bada boom, this is what you get. Just it's one of those places that's really just set up for photography. It makes it super easy, honestly, but it is a challenging exposure blend because of all of those trees on the C stacks. Those trees, you have to really pay attention when you're blending two different images together. Otherwise you can get halos around the trees and it's a challenging exposure blend, but luminosity mass to the rescue. We worked on this shot a lot during our post-processing sessions. So Dan asks, let's hear some beard grooming tips to get one as rocking as yours. Well, I have no tips for you, Dan, because I probably have the worst groomed beard on YouTube. The trick is just to never cut it and it keeps growing. So Noah asks, does your reliance on making a living via photography make it difficult to step away while in a creative rut? Also, thanks for all the help. I've learned more from you than anywhere else. Well, first of all, thank you, Noah. That's very kind. And yes, it does. One of the challenging things about, you know, doing what you love for a living is you do it for a job. And then when your job is done, then what do you do? When the very thing that you love to spend your time doing becomes your job as well, it's really difficult to strike a balance. I really struggle with getting away from photography because I love photography so much. I, I want to do it all the time, but you can't do one thing all the time and be happy. And I've really been struggling, especially like this last two months or so, because I haven't seen the amount of growth in my own photography that I have in the past. I've really plateaued skill level wise and post-processing wise. And because of my podcast and because of YouTube, I, I feel immense amounts of pressure to always be growing and evolving and always talking about it. Like I can't, I can't really take a break because you people will forget about me. Um, it's, it's a weird thing. So I feel pressure to continue to do photography and continue to create videos about photography, even when I don't have the self-confidence about my own photography to really be doing that. Having a YouTube channel and having a podcast about photography requires an amount of self-confidence that sometimes I don't always feel. And I, I'm really bad in the way that I don't have a super sick, thick skin. So if I get just a couple mean comments roll in either here or somewhere else, it hits me harder than it should. And it hits me harder than it probably does other people because I, I'm not somebody that has just an amazing amount of self-confidence. I, I know that I'm a decent photographer and I know that like, you know, I feel confident in that way, but I'm still very vulnerable. I've got that creative person's thing where sometimes I just want to crawl in a hole and hide from the world. 
YouTube is not the best place to crawl into a hole and hide from the world. So that that's where I feel the biggest pressure is when I'm not feeling super confident, it's very difficult for me to take a break. And so that's that's where I've been lately because <laughs> everything I do, you know, we're teaching workshops and, and having this YouTube channel. It requires a certain amount of self-confidence and self-assurance that sometimes I don't always feel. And that's where I've been struggling lately. Christopher asks, I would love to hear an updated list of the top weather apps and how to use them. Also, a breakdown of different cl types of clouds, weather powder patterns, and how to interpret them coming. Yeah, this is an in-depth topic, and I'll probably save this for a future video, but suffice it to say, the main apps that I use are Weatherbug for just quick, easy stuff. I love Clear Outside for cloud elevation predictions and cloud amount predictions. And I also love Storm because it's really easy to just pick a location and get the forecast for that location. So if you're trying to, you know, figure out what the weather is going to be like in an entire region. That can be really useful because you can just quickly see the precipitation and the cloud amount predictions as well as, you know, the forecast, the five-day forecast for that area. Guy asks, what was my process that permitted me to grow to a point of reaping a salary through photography and was it all fun? Uh, no, it was not all fun. When I first went to became a full-time photographer. I was working, you know, a nine to five, 40 hour a week day job, sometimes more than 40 hours a week. And then on the weekends, I would go out and I would do family sessions and, and senior portraits and real estate and even some weddings. And it wasn't until I was making enough money during that weekend to sustain myself that I felt comfortable leaving my day job. So if a person can make as much during the weekend as they can during the week, of their day job that that gives them the self-confidence to know that you're going to be able to make ends meet. And I, I encourage people not to take a leap too soon. Utilize all of that extra time that you have to the best of your abilities and make sure that you can actually, you know, create a, a sustainable business with that extra time. And only at that point do you take that full, you know, leap that next step of quitting the day job and trying to transition into full-time photography. But when I first started, I did everything. I was families and seniors and real estate and product photography and weddings. I shot a little bit of everything. And it wasn't until later in my career when people wanted to know what I knew because I had reached a certain level of proficiency with photography that workshops and landscape photography became a source of income. I sold some prints, but not nearly enough to pay bills. <laughs> I was I would struggle to pay my power bill with the amount of prints that I was selling, but that that stuff came later. Sam asks, what are my top three tips for editing images? Number one, edit locally. Don't do just big global adjustments. Try to only affect the part of the photo that you want to affect. So do that through adjustment brushes, graduated filters, radial filters, or using layers and layer masks inside of Photoshop. Tip two, don't overdo it. Everybody overdoes everything when they first learn how to post process, and that's natural, but try to find that area where you're not doing too much. You want it to be stylized, but not to the point of just cartoony and overdone. And that, that's a, that takes a while. Yeah, that's a long process, but try not to overdo it. And step three, try to... Keep it semi-natural, you know, try to draw some lines in the sand with your own own post-processing. For me, I try to keep things, you know, in the realm of possibility, like does this actually happen in nature? Do purple skies, skies really exist? I try to keep things in the realm of realistic yet stylized and have them uh, convey a mood. I try really hard to keep it the way that I experienced it. And a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm amping up what was there and I'm emphasizing what I liked and downplaying what I didn't like, but I'm still keeping it in the realm of, does it happen in nature? Does this ever actually happen? And a lot of times those purple skies and, and crazy things that some people do with their post-processing does not actually happen in nature. You got to draw your own lines in the sand of what you will and won't do. Try not to overdo it and work locally. 
Dominique asks, Nick, I love your work. You used to use the Canon 70 to 300. Now you use Sony's 100 to 400. Is that extra 100 millimeters of extra range useful in landscape photography? I can't decide if I should go 300 or 400 at the far end. I used to use the 70 to 200, but I oftentimes find it too short. So, you know, honestly, like the 300 to 400 area, I probably don't use as often as the meat of it, you know, the 100 to 300. The biggest reason I went with the 100 to 400 on the Sony side is because it's just an awesome lens. It's sharper than, you know, the 70 to 300. There is a 70 to 300 or 80 to 300 on the Sony side, but it's not a super sharp professional lens. The 100 to 400 is. I definitely find a 100 to 400 far more useful than a 70 to 200 in the landscape photography world and to be able to get an extra 200 millimeters for not a lot of extra size is really nice um, so me personally that's why i went with 100 to 400 but i don't think if i was on the canon side i would i would want the 100 to 400 over the 70 to 300 because the 70 to 300 is actually a really good lens and it's like way smaller than the 100 to 400 so it's kind of like a weight to usefulness balance. Like, do you want that extra weight for a little bit of extra reach or is 300 enough? And I think oftentimes on the Canon side, just because of the quality of the glass, the 300 is enough. Adam asks, any tips on cold and wet weather gear such as clothing, jackets, coats, pants, footwear for those of us that are a little um, larger than average? I don't know what you're talking about. What brands and where to get them? Also, what software besides Photoshop and Lightroom do I use, even if it's just rarely? Okay, so first of all, um, Columbia. I wear a lot of Columbia stuff just because it's it's a good brand. It's got a lot of good gear, but it's not like super expensive like an Arc'teryx or Arc'teryx. My favorite jacket is still my Cabela's Guidewear jacket. I wear that thing a lot. I like it because it's got lots of pockets, perhaps too many pockets. It's Gore-Tex and it's really warm. So that jacket with like a puffy jacket underneath, I'm good for really, really cold temperatures. And then if it gets too warm or whatever, I can just take the under layer off. I really like that jacket. The most important thing it, for me anyways, is I've been trying to have an outer layer of Gore-Tex. So I've got like a set of Gore-Tex Burgess rain pants. I got those on Thomas's recommendation. I really like those because they're easy to get on and off because of the zippers on the side. The Gore-Tex is really nice just because it's it's breathable and it's waterproof. If you get the kind of PVC style pant, they like they get sweaty and yucky underneath when you're hiking very much in them. Gore-Tex breathes a lot easier. I have been experimenting with some different brands, like for example, I have an REI jacket that I really like because it's really lightweight, Gore-Tex as well. But the main thing is Gore-Tex everything for me, that's what I like. So my boots that I really love, I'm actually on my third set of them are the Solomon GTX Gore-Tex boots. They're waterproof all the way up to the cuff and they're really comfortable, they last really well. They're worth the money. In regards to the software part of things, I've been trying to experiment a little bit with Capture One just because I get questions about it all the time and I should at least have some experience with some other programs other than Adobe stuff. I've been struggling with Capture One just because it's frustrating that it doesn't do what I want it to do, how I want it to do it. And I've got so much so much knowledge in one place with, with Photoshop it's really hard for me to learn another program, but I, I'm taking the time to try to learn some kind of workflow where I can start in Capture One, start editing in Lightroom because people or in Photoshop because people say that Capture One does so much better with Sony files. So I wanted to give it a chance. Um, not having success with it though. Mark asks, how do I balance family stuff and photography trips and outings? Do I take my family with me sometimes? Sometimes I do, but not nearly as much as I wish I did. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges for being a workshop leader and having a family and a kid at home is trying to find that balance. Some people, and I don't know how they do it, they are gone more than I am 
which I'm gone a lot. People that are gone more than I am, if they have a family at home, I have no idea how that works. You know, there's some photographers that I can think of that have kids at home, but those kids must not like know their parents very well because they're gone all the time. And that one of the challenges that I run into is the fact that because I'm gone so much with workshops, because, you know, my, I'm lucky enough that my workshops sell out a lot. But because I'm gone so much during those workshops, it doesn't allow me a lot of time to go out and shoot personally anymore because I'm spending all of that free time going out and doing workshops. And if I do go out on my own, it's at the expense of family time. And, you know, there are times that I can take take my family with me, but it's it's never the same taking your family with you and trying to be productive photography wise because they don't enjoy camping in the middle of nowhere and getting up for sunrises and hiking into places as much as a photographer does. And then they don't understand when you want to be at that location for three or four hours straight. They get kind of bored. I don't take my family as much as I wish that I could. Hopefully when my son is a little bit older, I'll be able to take him to some of the scary places that I go to. At this point, no, I can't take him to some of the cliffs and stuff that I, I often go to. Um, so that's a, that's another challenge. Um, I wish I had a better answer, but uh, I don't. So Peter asks, what photograph have I taken that makes me the feel the most proud? I would say the best photo that I've ever taken is still that one wave photo with the birds. Everybody know I call it unrest. In my chasing waves video, I captured this one frame where the you know the birds are kind of swarming these waves as they were coming in. We have these big beautiful waves crashing against the cliffs and then crashing against themselves. And we also had amazing light at that at that point. And I got probably the majority of my wave crashing portfolio that morning because the light was good, the waves were good, everything was just working out. And it's, I've been trying to live up to that photo ever since. It's still probably one of the best photos I've ever taken. And what budget friendly starter lens would I recommend for astrophotography? Well, it totally depends on what camera system you're on, but oftentimes the answer is going to be a Rokinon 14 millimeter F 2.8 or maybe a Rokinon 24 millimeter F 1.4. If you are on like a crop sensor, there's a Samyang, I think it's a 12 millimeter F 2 that would be a great little astro lens as well. So uh, that, that's often the answer to that question. Next question is, what is the best budget monitor for editing? And what's the best way to color calibrate it? I personally use a BenQ 27 inch wide gamma monitor, and I'm pretty sure that they make a more affordable monitor than this. I And I don't, he says no more than 500 pounds. I wanna say that this monitor was actually cheaper than that. Um, but the most important thing is to get something that is not 4K because the reason you don't want a 4K monitor when you're editing for the web is because when you go to web sharpen and you're, you know, you're looking at an image that is 2000 pixels on the long end, that's going to be very small on your screen. You can't properly determine what the sharpness or the sharpening is going to be like on other people's screens because you're seeing a, a totally different pixel density. A lot of times I'm always trying to get a 2.7K monitor, uh, which will also make it more affordable and that's great. The biggest thing is you just don't wanna go all the way up to a, like a four or 5K for photo editing because you're seeing things in a different pixel density than everybody else is gonna see them. Color calibration is super important. So this is an X-Rite Pro 1 or I, X-Rite i1 Pro. Color calibrating is one of the most important things you can do for editing. This will ensure that your colors are accurate, your contrast is right, and it's just super important. It's worth every penny, especially if you're printing or delivering. If you're doing any kind of pro professionally like delivered work, you need to color calibrate. So that's the X-Rite i1 Pro. Um, I think that's my second one of those that I purchased now, the old one I I gave to a friend, but these are super important for making sure that your screen is displaying stuff properly. Otherwise your colors could be off and you wouldn't know it. 
The next question is, this might be a silly question, but a lot of photographers say that DSLR these days will do a great job when it comes to landscape photography. Just wondering if there's a point when you can take an entry-level or mid-level DSLR to the limits of its ability. Do you think there's an obvious threshold on where those lower-end cameras just won't cut it anymore? This is an interesting question. I think that there's several genres of photography that... Uh, really separate the the average cameras from the great cameras and usually it's mostly going to be sensors astrophotography is one of them you know if you take a camera that is amazing at those higher isos and then try to take that same exact photo with you know a entry level dslr crop sensor it's going to be a massive difference just because they perform so poorly at those higher ISOs. Another genre is going to be like birds in flight or sports. It's, you can do it with a lower end DSLR, but it's a hell of a lot easier with a, a DSLR or a mirrorless body that has a really good autofocus system. And the lens matters a lot in both those scenarios. You know, the amount of light that it lets in, how fast it focuses, that stuff is going to be as limiting or as enabling as the camera is. So, you know, there's a reason that a lot of that, that more expensive glass and those more expensive cameras are worth the money. If you're somebody that does those types of photography more than other types of photography, it can tend to be worth it. That's why sports photographers have, you know, $10,000 lenses because they couldn't do what they do with something lower end you there will always be the the troll on the internet that's like ella you must be a terrible photographer because i get outstanding photos with my kit lens the gear does not matter it's my preferred lens when i photograph my cousin's soccer games and children in the park those people are just keyboard warriors they don't know what they're talking about it takes professional gear to get some of that stuff there's other types of photography where like portraiture or just a, a static landscape where it's a low dynamic range scene where pretty much any camera is going to look the same. Another area where a good sensor is going to make a big difference are going to be things like dynamic range. Like if you're shooting directly into the sun with moving subjects, a lot of times you you have to use just a single frame. And the, the amount that you can lift those shadows without having a bunch of noise really matters in those situations because you don't have the luxury of, you know, bracketing images and just getting one for the sky, one for the shadows. The better the sensor is in that situation, the, the more successful that end photo is going to be. And that's why a lot of people love, you know, a lot of dynamic range on a sensor is because it makes their life easier because they can use one photo rather than three used to be you had to exposure blend three images together and a lot of people are getting away with just one now. And that's because of the better sensors. The next question is, I don't remember if this has ever came up with any landscape photographer so far, but I think it's an important one to consider. If you go full-time landscape photographer, how does this affect the relationships with others? As a landscape photographer, you probably have to consider if you want to have children, for example, because one spends so much time on the road and if your girlfriend or wife understands this, I get a feeling that no one really considers this before taking landscape photography seriously. Also, if you could, which aspect of landscape photographer would you remove or what annoys me? So we've already kind of talked a little bit about that, but you're absolutely right. There's a lot of people that when you're 24, 22, whatever, you're not, sometimes you're not always thinking about, you know, settling down and having a family, but someday you are going to think about that. And especially if you've already started a family of some kind, Landscape photography is going to put a strain on it because if you want to travel the amount that it takes to be a full-time landscape photographer, whether you're doing workshops like I do or whether you're just traveling the world and selling the prints, it puts a strain on, on family for sure. The biggest names in landscape photography, a lot of times they're single or they, they have a partner that understands, but they're not going to have children. It reminds me, on my podcast, I actually had Art Wolf on the show, and I asked him, you know, how do you balance relationships with with traveling and photography like you do? And he says, well... And the fact is, I'm single, and I probably will remain single the rest of my life. Yeah. I, I've got great friends from around the world, but I don't live a life like most people. I don't have cats or dogs, though I love cats and dogs. I just have to make those sacrifices yeah. to gain what I've got. 
And so nobody's life is complete. Nobody's got a perfect life. I certainly don't. But what I have is a world of friends, close friends. And for me, at this point in my life, that's good enough. And so I'm not making compromises with a spouse. And I probably have never had a spouse because of that very, very reason. The most successful people in the world, whether they're athletes or whatever, they often have to sacrifice things like relationships and family to be where they're at. And people have to ask themselves, is that a sacrifice you're willing to make in your life? Are you going to be that serious about photography or travel? Because at some point, if you're going to go all the way, you're going to have to sacrifice something. And a lot of times it is family or at least the quality of the family, the relationships you have with your family that are going to suffer. So for me personally, I, you know, I try to travel one week a month. So if I'm gone for one week and home for three, I feel like that is an acceptable ratio to have a good relationship with my family. But it's a tough one because if I'm gone for that week, it means that I I have to be home during those next three. And if the light gets good or the conditions get good, it's really hard for me not to want to go shoot personal stuff at that point. And so it's a challenge and it's one that continues, you know, as when my son is older, I'll be older too, which kind of sucks. That's something you never think about. But when my son is older and out of the house, I can travel as much as I want. But I'll also be an old man, which that kind of sucks. Yeah, it's, it's something to consider for sure. Marcus asks, how did I begin to start running my own workshops? And what was the process that I took to make it happen? So it was very organic. Like everything that I've done, it's been organic. It hasn't been part of some kind of, you know, sit down plan or, you know, five year plan that I made for myself. I did things that felt right and it felt like it was the right time to do it. So my first two workshops that I ever were a part of, I was just a co-leader for another person leading a workshop that gave me, you know, not only the confidence that like, well, people are starting to see me as capable of leading a workshop because they asked me to do it, but also it gave me some examples of how other people do it and frankly, how other people, how it should not be done. <laughs> It was great examples of how not to lead a workshop. After that, I, I got the confidence to lead a workshop in my own area where I live, where I have lots of personal local knowledge of. So I led my very first privately ran workshop in the Palouse, which is where I live. And so it was very easy for me to lead one there because honestly, it was more of a tour. At that point, I was not like a super accomplished, amazing photographer, not that I am now, but I did have a lot of local knowledge. So I think that the first place that people can successfully lead a workshop is going to be in their own stomping grounds because you have that local knowledge to share and that gives value to the people that are coming on the workshop. You shouldn't just try to, you know, lead a workshop somewhere where you don't have lots of local knowledge because you're not providing value to the people that are coming on the workshop. Your first workshop should always be in your neck of the woods where you have that knowledge. That way you're still providing value. And then you can slowly start to ramp things up and, and work things out of your local area. But for me, it was very organic. I would encourage people to go that route rather than, you know, sitting down and creating a five-year plan because then you're doing things kind of for the wrong reasons at that point. You're not doing it because you're you love it. You're doing it from a sense of being an entrepreneur and trying to make a buck. It'll never resonate with people if that's why you're doing it, for one. For two, you're not gonna have longevity in anything if you're doing it for money. The only way you're ever gonna have longevity is if you are if you love it. You know, if you're doing what, what you love, then you will have longevity because you love it. And you'll be willing to go through those hard times because the, the good times are so good and you love doing what you do. Sam asks, what are some of the stereotypes I wish didn't exist in the photography community? First of all, Instagram as a whole, like Instagram started off as like a social media platform, but now it's like a culture. Like I've literally met people that were like, you know, I've been really working on becoming a professional Instagrammer, you know? Yeah. And it's just baffling to me that that's it. First of all, is that a thing? 
people are professional Instagrammers, and and then later on, I've met professional Instagrammers, and yep, sure enough, it's a thing. Sick tones, bro. Sick tones. Yeah, I don't know. It's so that's one. The the whole Instagram photographer, the Instagrammer, that thing is just it boggling to me. They don't provide a service. They don't even they don't provide anything really. They don't provide value to anybody and yet they make a living doing it just going around taking selfies it's crazy to me another one would probably be there's always that one guy at like a you know let's say we're at a delicate arch in moab somewhere where there's a lot of photographers all crammed into a small place and somebody not knowing not knowing the rules that are not rules goes out and to take a quick selfie in front of an arch or something and there's always the one guy that just freaks out. It could be like two hours before a sunset and they're not even taking a photo. But if somebody walks in their shot there, they just start yelling and screaming and like, Damn it! Can't you see you're in my shot? Get out of there! <laughs> those people are nuts. <laughs> and there's there's always one at those uh, at those places. And I, and I always feel like I have to be the person that's like, It's not the end of the world. You know, the good photo doesn't even come for another hour and a half. So just chill out. They're going to be out of the scene in a second. There's always the very entitled people at those scenes. And so if you you find yourself feeling those feelings at that moment, take a deep breath and remember that there's more to life than just getting that one photo. Like how you treat other people matters. You know, (laughs) karma is maybe a thing. So just chill out and... This too will pass. There's more to life than getting that one photo that one evening. It'll be okay. So Chad asks, how is the R4 holding up compared to the A9 with autofocus, dynamic range, and noise? So I've been shooting with the A7R4 for a month now or so. And so I've kind of gotten a feel for how it is compared to both the R3, R, A7R3, which I just sold, and my A9. A7R4 is not as good in low light as the R3 it was, and is definitely not as good in low light, higher ISOs as the A9. So the A9 blows it away for high ISO performance. Autofocus, it has all of the same stuff as the A9. You know, it can do all of the same algorithm stuff as the A9, but it doesn't doesn't push a lens like the A9. The A9 is much faster and snappier, has much better autofocus. Dynamic range of the R4 is good. It's better than the R, uh, the A9, but it's probably not as solid as the R3 was. I think the sensor in general on the R3 was better than the R4, which is maybe controversial to say, but I'm telling it how it is. I think the R3 sensor was a little bit stronger, a little bit better, but I do like the extra resolution. So if you're shooting ISO 100, don't need that higher ISO performance. You're going to love the sharpness and the crispness and the amount of resolution in the R4. Also, I like the body better. Most of everything I like better on the R4, but I think, you know, higher ISOs and the dynamic range of the R3 was a little bit better. Let's take one more question. Let's take it from Darren, who I've actually been on his podcast. It's the Irish Photography Podcast. Um, Really good show. He says, is it the photographer that creates a photo or a scene that presents itself? So if you had enough fall color leaves to just like strategically place all over a foreground, you could totally make a photo anywhere. That's sarcasm. Don't ever do that. (laughs) That's that's a pet peeve of mine. Um, I think that it's a combination of both. I think that sometimes a good photographer can go into a place with very very few obvious compositions and still come away with something i think adam gibbs is a perfect example of somebody that is really good at finding composition in a place where it's really really difficult i really look up to photographers like that that just they can work a scene until until the scene does present itself but there are some some scenes that you walk into it and they're just there and the photographer knows how to capture it. I think it's got to be a combination of both. I think that some people are really good at spotting composition in a place where it's not obvious, but I also think 
that people that don't have that particular skill can totally work on it. Force themselves to go into a random forest or just a, ran a place, you know, a seascape with no obvious, you know, sea stacks in the background or something and try to just work it and work it until they come away with something. I think a lot of times it's, it, it is a skill, but it's a learnable skill. Um, it's one, something that I'm working on all the time is trying to go into a place where there's no obvious shot and trying to still come away with something. And there's no better feeling to me than figuring out a place like that where you go in, it seems like chaos and then you come away with something. And that's one of my favorite things ever. That's why I like, you know, going into those forest scenes is because I feel accomplished when I come out. If I go to a Tipsu Lake with a Mount Rainier in the background and a reflection in the foreground, it's almost so easy that I feel a little bit dirty, a little bit soiled afterwards because anybody could have took that shot. The only difference is going to be the light and the processing. But there's something special about going into a place where there is no obvious shot and coming away with something. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we're going to try to do this every once in a while. Hopefully there was some nuggets in there that you guys care about. If not, sorry for wasting your time. Um, I've, I've got some reviews coming up soon. I, I've got two co filter companies that have sent me some stuff. Uh, Polar Pro has sent me their, what are they calling it? The Summit Landscape Photographer Kit. I've got it around here somewhere. Seems like a pretty good filter system. And then uh, another co filter company is sending me their kit. So we're going to be doing some reviews on that stuff. And something that I'm implementing now that I haven't in the past is anything that a company sends me for review and I get to keep, I'm going to be giving away to you guys. So that way we get rid of the trolls that say, Oh yeah, of course you're going to say you like their filters because they gave them to you for free. This will be a way of dealing with the people that say that stuff. So once we reach 100,000 subscribers, which could be just after the new year, somewhere around in there, I'm going to be doing a big giveaway. So we're going to be giving away camera bags, hopefully a couple tripods and definitely filters. So stay tuned for that stuff. Um, yeah, that's about all I got for you guys. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Take it easy, everybody.